All right, we're live. Um, everyone, welcome. Excited to have this discussion today with TD. Uh, if you are here, throw us a little message in the chat bot there. There's a little box that says, say something nice. Let us know. We'd love to talk to you. Um, this session today is going to be super informal. We're going to talk about leadership. Uh, we're going to talk about starting a coaching business. There's a lot of stuff here we're going to unpack. And so if you have any questions throughout the session today as a bit of a housekeeping item, uh, let us know in the chat box. You can either put it in there or there's a little feature that says ask a question. Um, and we'll use that. We we'll either pull it in towards if it's relevant to the topic then or we'll save it towards the end and um, and do a little live rapid fire Q&A there. Uh, there will also be a recording of this. So if anyone has to jump and you can't make the full session, no problem at all. We'll make sure everyone gets a recap so you can catch the full chat. Um, it's great to have you all here. Uh, I'm going to do a quick intro for myself. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm going to have TD intro himself, and then we're going to get into it. Um, I'm Jeremy. I'm here on the practice team. I get to work with tons of coaches across all different sorts of verticals from mm -hmm. leadership coaching, life coaching, business coaching. Um, so I try to put myself in the shoes of a coach in these kinds of conversations when I get to grill our guest host and ask all sorts of awesome questions. But if I ask something that you didn't think of, or if you want to ask something that I didn't think of, Go ahead and drop it in the chat box. I'd love to make sure we get everything covered today so you get a good good coverage. Um, Titi, I'm going to have you intro yourself because you know yourself real well, of course. And then, uh... <laughs> scary. I scare myself. But yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. I appreciate it, Jeremy. Um, hi, I'm Titi Smyers. I'm a lifetime learner, and uh, I'm continuing down that journey now as an executive coach. Um, I've kinda, I call myself the accidental coach because I kind of got into this uh, accidentally, but I found that it's my calling, and I love it. Uh, I am a career naval officer. I did 31 years in the United States Navy as a naval flight officer. I kind of became a leadership guy. I commanded a squadron of combat air crews out of Jacksonville, Florida, and wound up doing a tour of the Pentagon, a couple of them, uh, going to the Eisenhower School at the National Defense University, and then finally uh, commanding a joint air base. And I did that job, loved it. I like to tell people I was a leadership guy, which means I actually had no marketable skills. So that's kind of where I fell. <laughs> but um, I, uh, when I left the Navy, I decided that I, rather than kind of roll, roll my Rolodex into working for a defense contractor, that I would take what the Navy taught me and seek to continue a life of service. So I began in nonprofits. I was a regional CEO for the American Red Cross for four years. I actually studied some coaching uh, back then in 2015 and was going to make the transition into being a coach then. Uh, but then I got recruited to take over a uh, major market United Way in Tarrant County, the western part of the DFW Metroplex. And uh, in what was probably the most challenging role of my professional life, actually. And then did that for four years, uh, created a succession plan and successfully turned over my relief. Then my wife and I went sailing on a catamaran uh, for a couple of years, up and down the East Coast into the Bahamas and back, and then down to the Caribbean and back. Uh, came back to sh shore after a couple of years, and uh, I started looking at what I was going to do next and discovered coaching. We can get into it, Jeremy, if you think it's worth telling the story, but I uh, really feel like this is what I've been prepared to do my whole life, and I've been, enjoyed cranking this business up and getting it started. Uh, I am by far not the most experienced executive coach on this call, so many of you out there are more so than me, but I'm happy to share uh, what I've picked up in the journey so far and what I'm looking forward to. So thanks for awesome. having me. Awesome. That's a great intro. Um, we're going to break this discussion up into like two buckets. We're going to first kind of talk about the executive leadership coach and leadership coaching side of things. And then we're also going to talk about some of the tactical pieces in like standing up and running a coaching business. So to begin, I'd love to just ask about where we start, right? When you talk about knowing if someone is a good fit to be a client of yours in your coaching practice, what are some of the factors that you look at to know if they're a good fit to work with? Well, one of them is uh, do they want to be coached. I, um, I actually declined my very first opportunity to have a client because it was a, it was in higher education and it was a university system that wanted uh, somebody to coach one of their tenured professors, uh, 40 years of worth of tenure. And the reason they did was it was a remedial assignment. He was a toxic personality and he just left this wake of terror wherever he went and people were leaving because of him and it was horrible for the organization, but they granted him tenure 
he was connected to about $14 million worth of contributions to the, to the system. And, uh, they wanted, they wanted me to coach him and in good conscience, I could, because I said, I, I, I could take your money for doing this, but the reality is you've got to come up with an off ramp for him. He's been rewarded for bad behavior for four decades. Uh, coaching is probably in my, in my opinion at the time, coaching was probably not the best uh, thing to try to take care of him. And, so that, that's a situation where if, if I'm introduced to somebody through a, a process that doesn't include them, I'm always suspect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if I am introduced, for example, uh, I've kind of fallen into this niche and Jeremy, I know you and I traded some messages yeah. earlier today about niches and I've kind of fallen into this niche of succession, coaching around succession plans. And if, if that happens, I, it tends to be something where maybe the board of directors calls me in or a CEO is asking me to coach the person they've identified as their successor. And those things tend to be really great. And I just I'm like, OK, it's a it's a it's a valuable developmental opportunity. So I'll try to make an initial meeting, a chemistry meeting in person. As a matter of fact, I've only got one client that I have not actually met in person. Uh, everybody I seek to meet in person, either for that initial chemistry call or very quickly after we sign a coaching agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that tends to be the, the real litmus test. We meet, we get to look each other in the eye, we get to square each other away, see how we drink our coffee or whatever, and then just decide if it's going to be a good relationship. And uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I, I have a form, too, that I sent out. I call it a welcome orientation and insight form. Mm -hmm. And I send that out and that gives me a chance to dig a little deeper into some things that they might not have gotten to share during our sit down or they were hesitant to share right away uh, that then they can let me know in advance. And all three of those things, the referral, how I get brought into the relationship, the face-to-face mm -hmm. -face chemistry meeting, and then the welcome orientation and insight gives me a really good feel for how this is going to work out. Yeah, that's great. And so after you get to the point where you're like, all right, this is a good fit. We're a good fit to work together. Where do you tend to start when it comes to that coaching relationship? Well, the, the form goes out and I get that insight anecdotally. And then I get to know their birthday and their significant other and things like that. So that's a personal connection. But then I seek to be pretty quantitative about it. I um, We do an assessment of, I do assessment of skill-based strengths and values-based strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, currently I'm using Clifton strengths for the skill-based strengths and VIA for the value-based strengths. Just mm -hmm. kind of look at their top five. And the reason I start there is because in my experience, and, and I tell people all the time, I am not a leadership expert. I don't bill myself as that, but I am a practitioner and I've done executive level leadership for about four decades. So including being a, a CEO in all three different economic sectors, all three major economic sectors. So I've, I've seen a lot. I've been privileged to see a lot of things and that's given me insight into how to ask questions. And so uh, in order to get to the point where we begin with my clients, authentic leadership, how they're wired, mm -hmm. we do that. We do that assessment and we take a look at, OK, here's here are the traits that you have that are already strengths in you. Um, I'm, I kind of operate from a perspective that building authentic leadership means we have to really focus on harnessing those traits to build great behaviors that they may not be exercising currently. And that's how we kind of jump into that with the assessment, with the anecdotal feedback I get from the form. And then we jump in and begin goal setting. Where mm -hmm. are you? Where are you trying to get? Let's put some timelines on those. And then we track progress toward them. Do you find that people, when you go through the, the outcomes of that assessment, are they more times uh, surprised by that? Or are they like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like I'm, I, that resonates with me. It's mostly, mostly validating. As a matter of fact, some some people, because when they reach this point in their professional career where they're leading an organization or about to be, they've taken these assessments at some point usually anyway. So mm -hmm. they've, they've seen who they, but maybe they've taken one of them, but not the other. Um, I have one client who their Clifton strengths top, the top five, puts them, all of their top five are in strategic thinking. All of them are in that domain. Mm -hmm. So we've used now the values-based strengths to, test, to direct us to how we grow in those other three domains. So it's sometimes it's enlightening to them to have both um, when they've only taken maybe one previous to that. Yeah, got you. 
Um, so after that point in time where you've kind of worked with them to identify where you're, where, where you're going, right? Goals and a roadmap to get there. Um, what does the coaching relationship tend to look like in terms of how you work with them, how they work with you? How do you structure that? So usually start with an initial face-to-face -face if we can. And mm -hmm. if it's somewhere that I'm in proximity or traveling to, I'll always subsequently try to replace a virtual meeting with a face-to-face -face if we can. And mm -hmm. we set a battle rhythm. It's been so funny too. Uh, and I'm sure all the, the folks out there that are executive coaches, I, I bet this resonates with you, but uh, it, it automatically defaults to uh, what Josh referred to as fortnightly, which I thought was great because I just say every, every other week. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a two week interval and I've had clients that, that look, want to accelerate that. And the way I work, uh, that's completely within the scope of our agreement. And so they'll move to weekly, but, but then uh, the urgent overcomes the important and they wind up having to maybe cancel every other one of these. So for whatever reason, it winds up being about a two week rhythm. Now in between that, I use the, uh, you know, you and I have talked, I'm a big fan of the practice app and I've integrated that into my practice. So I will use the messaging uh, and the to do's to follow up and encourage them as we go through. Uh, if I know that they've got uh, challenges coming up or specific dates or milestones that are coming up between our sessions, I'll reach out to them at those days in the morning mm -hmm. and encourage them, remind them of the things we talked about. And then uh, I make it part of my practice to keep them reading on the subjects that we're working on, right? Whether that's curiosity or vulnerability or executive presence or whatever. So I've curated a pretty nice reading list and um, I will just mail them books as gifts, um, you know, every, every when, whenever they're finishing up a book yeah. so they can constantly get in the habit of developing. So the relationship becomes, the way I do it at least, yeah, it becomes very, uh, very, you know, kind of professionally intimate. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's ongoing. And, it's my goal and it's kind of how I state this to myself. I want every one of my clients to feel like they're my only client. Mm -hmm. Is there any notion of like, I know Josh actually talked about this in our last uh, event that we did about client onboarding. Do you, do you have any components of like accountability? Is that at all a part of your practice or do you feel that um, that's not, that's not my domain? Oh, it's, it was a great question. And I really enjoyed Josh's treatment of that when you interviewed him about, you know, mm -hmm. kind of asking the client the levels of accountability you want. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's my Navy training, but I just kind of default to boom, accountability. So I, uh, I asked them, this is what we said we were going to do. How are we doing on that? Yeah. And I followed up every time. Now, obviously it's not, it's not in the relationship for me to chastise them if they haven't gotten there or that's generally not helpful. But I will say, you know, ask questions like what kind of challenges have you, what kind of walls have you hit that prevented you from getting there? Or mm -hmm. what kind of new challenges have been interjected that changed the dynamics? Uh, and, and in that way, the accountability is just ingrained in the normal coaching dialogue. Yeah. Um, so so I, I think my clients kind of feel like, all right, if I don't move on this, TD's going to ask me about it when we yeah. get together next. And uh, that creates a kind of an amicable level of accountability but it's yeah. definitely there do you feel like um because of the the kind of customer the kind of client you have because that they probably as an executive and a leader have a bunch of other stuff obviously on their plate people are hounding them for yeah. to not overstep in that or and, and lean on the on the client to either ask for more accountability or less accountability that's a great question um what i've discovered and the way i kind of the way I structure the, the to do's or the things we're actively working on is mm -hmm. I don't use case studies or create situations and say, what would you do through this? Really, the only kind of thing external to their actual workflow that I do at all is send them books to read as they go through. Everything else is tied directly with the challenges they're working with right now. Mm -hmm. So so in expecting them to accomplish some of the things we work we're working on, they will have done those in the context of the things that they're actively doing in their roles. So it kind of goes hand in hand with their success. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know one of the things we're, we, you wanted to talk about a little bit was how do you measure the success of the coach? Yes. Right. Um, and I've got maybe, maybe it's because of my newness in this role. Maybe it's because of how I feel myself, but I kind of feel like when you use things like a 360 or a Q12 from Gallup, you know, at the beginning and then again at the end to measure the success, that's really a measurement of the success of the executive. 
yeah. not necessarily the coach. And so um, I rely on uh, a feedback form. I send a coaching review at the end of each coaching uh, period, even okay. if that client is going to renew for a new one, a new period. I send a coaching review. I get that review back. Um, some of the best ways, though, that I've received feedback on uh, on my uh, success, I guess you'd say, my how effective my coaching is, uh, comes from direct feedback, live feedback from mm-hmm. my clients. Um, I received a, a message uh, through the practice app, actually, just a couple of weeks ago from one of my clients who yeah. we've been working with her on executive presence and um, kind of rebranding her as a chief executive rather than an officer in her particular area of expertise. Mm. And in doing so, uh, she has had to stretch her wings and take on some new strategic responsibilities. And she had stood up in a meeting and exercised some of the things we had been working on Mm. in her presentation of that new strategic direction. Afterwards, one of the executives in that organization stopped her and complimented her on how much she has really grown into this role. Mm. And she, she couldn't help herself. She texted me back. She says, I'm just so excited. I wanted to share this with you because I yeah. wanted you to share in the credit. And um, and I'll tell you how I responded. And I, I'd love to hear from some of the other coaches out there if you think this is silly or not silly. But my response was pretty simple. Mm. You're the player on the field. You scored the touchdown. Coach is on the sidelines. So, you know, deflecting it back, to encourage that person. I mean, the only reason I exist in this person's life Mm -hmm. is to help them as an executive achieve success. So you have to kind of go back thinking, sure, I want to measure myself to see if I'm successful. But ultimately, the only reason I even exist or I'm getting a check from that organization is so that uh, that client is successful. It's interesting because I think that there's um, a little bit of a balance between you know, you being a former executive, how much of this is coaching versus is there like a mentorship kind of balance that you have? So, you know, when I first got into this business, I, was, I read a lot of stuff and I even, you know, brought a lot of it into my coaching agreement. That, mm-hmm. yeah, this, you know, this is this is coaching. This is counseling. This is mentoring. And here's the yeah. difference kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality, though, in this space that I that I've at least the reality I operate under is that coaching and mentoring. Um, they work really in tandem with mm-hmm. each other a, a lot of times. And the reason I say that is because if I had come into a role in coaching where I didn't have this executive level experience, then mm-hmm. I would really be restricted to just kind of asking the questions and drawing out the client. Um, it kind of more of a, you know, almost like a counselor works, right? Except yeah. in the professional space of, of a coach. But because I've walked that path, I have a whole other set of questions I ask now. So if I say, well, what are you going to do about your about being at odds with your chairman of your board of directors? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, well, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to challenge him in front of the executive committee and all that. I, because I've done that, <laughs> I've got a whole other set of questions that yeah. I can now pull out and ask. Are you prepared for the fallout? Do you think there's a chance that you could get a vote of no confidence? I mean, what are these things? Right. So, and those are questions that aren't going to be uh, at the top of the head of somebody who hasn't walked that yeah. talk. Right. So so I do find myself, you know, uh, dancing across that line pretty frequently. And um, I've heard this uh, recently from uh, Jeff Auerbach, who runs the, uh, the College of Executive Coaching in California. And, you know, he's kind of put it the way that it's sometimes like this. If there's high levels of competence and maybe low levels of um, uh, motivation, you know, then that's one situation. If there's high mm-hmm. motivation but low competence, you find sometimes that, that they want a little more mentoring. And mm-hmm. right, if it's the opposite, they're not going to want it. They're highly competent and confident in who they are, and they're you know they're not going to want too much input on that side. So you know, as those things blow, kind of like squeezing the ends of a balloon. Yeah, and say that one more time: high levels of confidence, low high levels, levels of-, of competence, therefore confidence, right? Um, and low levels of uh, maybe you know. Uh, uh, inspiration or initiative, let's say initiative, yeah. then they're 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 kind of happy where they are. They're not going to appreciate much <laughs> of what you give them. If they're high initiative and high confidence, they probably don't need it. Yeah. It's generally when they're high on initiative and they're low on competence that they're willing to accept 
uh, mm -hmm. a little more mentoring in there. So it's during those times that um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll interject some things. But you know, I always try to have it be something that the client draws rather than something that I just throw out there. So we go through that journey together. Yes, um, that's it's interesting. So you talked actually about one scenario uh, or maybe a client that ran into a couple of scenarios. What kinds of ways do you tailor your coaching towards your client? You said that you want every client to feel like uh, you're their only client. I think that's yeah. a really good way to operate. How do you how do you instill that feeling in the in the people you work with? Well, most of it is direct you know, engagement. I don't I, I try not to take too many notes while I'm on the session with them. If I have to jot down something because it's a phrase I'm unfamiliar with or something, I'll mm -hmm. do it, you know, here, you know, and, and, and I, I track notes, you know, through the practice app. Mm -hmm. That's how I do the notes and I'll just leave it open and start typing uh, while I'm looking, you know, at the camera. So I engage mm -hmm. with them. I don't get distracted. I don't really talk about things that have come from other clients. Okay. Uh, or, or even if they're anonymous, I just refer to them and their mm -hmm. situation. Uh, try not to talk about anything I'm involved in. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had one client that had worked with a coach before. wasn't that excited about working with a coach again okay. because th that client said that the relationship with the other coach turned into a, a, B a BS session about their book they were writing every time that they got in there. And it can't be about the coach. Um, yeah. you know, it's got to be about the client. So I keep it client focused and centric. I allow them direct access to me at any time. We set a battle rhythm. And as I said earlier, it's almost always defaults to, to every other week. But they have access to me with a phone call, text, emails, if they need anything. And I, I've, I've had all of my clients avail themselves of that. And I mm -hmm. take it. If there's any way I can take that, that call, I take it. If I can't, I send them a text. I'll get right back to you in 20 minutes or whatever. And, and I do. And in that way, I can, they kind of feel like I'm their on-call coach. Now, yeah. some of you might be thinking, OK, well, are you charging for that? I, I don't work on an hourly fee. I work on a retainer. Mm -hmm. And the amount that I've set monthly, uh, that's built into it. So I expect them to utilize me, uh, you know, at least an hour a month more than they've set on the schedule. And that's how mm -hmm. I've set my, uh, my retainer fee. Are there... On the converse side, are there people who don't who don't take advantage of that level of access to you? And do you say, hey, maybe you should be more inquisitive or maybe you should ask for my help more? Like, do you ever find that people aren't on that far and they're on the opposite end of the spectrum? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. You know, the people that I find that that go that way, that don't reach out to me in the interim, tend to be the people who are seeking confidence in what they do. And they just don't feel confident enough to 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 reach out in the intervals. It's odd because when we meet during our, our biweekly sessions, they're very much about soaking it up. You know, they want to they want to gain that competence mm -hmm. that, that comes from not their technical background, but from dealing with people in caring, yeah. communication, those kinds of things. They, they soak it up, but then in between, they kind of let themselves kind of run um, on their own or, you know, so flying solo. And what, but what I do when I, when I sense that there, I know they've got things they're struggling with, I'll send notes to them. I'll reach mm -hmm. out to them. So again, I try to make this very proactive, really proactive one there. And, and, and kind of to what you talked about earlier about how do I make it uh, unique for them? They feel like it's, you know, I'm their, they're my only client and tailor the coach experience to them. Remember, I took that assessment at the beginning and what we work on is their specific set of growth areas. Yeah. I call it values based growth because it's based on their values and their skills and we home in on those. And uh, so that tends to really, I mean, every time I log on with a client, uh, Hey, I'm excited about it. It's just, it, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like just I'm helping somebody. It's a great experience. And, and, this person is going to get that CEO gig or this person is going to be a more effective executive director or whatever the situation is. So it's exciting. Uh, and, uh, and I guess because of all of those things together, it really makes each feel unique. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there's one commonality though, that the vast majority of my clients suffer okay. from and, and that's, that's a lack of confidence. Okay. Uh, all, not, not all, but all uh, 80% of my client base at some level is dealing with their their confidence and you know that could be something from you know maybe that's a, a peter principle thing or you know maybe that's an imposter syndrome thing mm -hmm. uh, 
But I think there are a lot of people leading organizations who are not necessarily confident in their ability to do everything they need to do. So, so uh, my let's get into that though a little bit. Like, what are the yeah. ways in which you help people? You know, I don't know if, if whether it comes out in just the coaching relationship or that's part of the initial assessment that you do. Mm -hmm. What are the steps that you take, and how do you think about making sure at the end of the coaching relationship that confidence is in is, is in a better position? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I kind of put three things at the center of my coaching practice. And if you go to my website, uh, it's a, a boldleader.com. But if you go there, right at the top, it says, you know, character, confidence, clarity. And these are the, the things that in my professional life I've discovered get most leaders in trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. when, we lead a, when we read about a leader getting in, in deep kimchi for something, it's almost always a character thing. And it's yeah. very seldom a performance thing. So we yes. start with character. Then we focus on confidence. And it's interesting, when I first started my practice, that wasn't the second word. The second word was competence. Okay. But because competence is so at the root of confidence, it's uh, just put confidence in there now. And at the end is clarity. And that, that's really the only kind of just-in-time thing you can work on, getting clarity in terms of your role in this specific situation, in terms of your direction ahead in this specific situation. So what I'll do with clients that, that state or – sometimes they don't state right away that confidence is something they want to work on. Sometimes mm -hmm. that comes through the discussions of what they're dealing with. Yeah. Well, you know, when I find, okay, how are you wrapping your head around that? Do you think you got the, the tools to, to knock that out? Do you need to reach to the outside? We go through those kind of conversations and 80% uh, of them get around to the point where they discover they need confidence. So what I'll try to do is take opportunities to open them up, to become vulnerable, Mm -hmm. to accept input of others in a way that strengthens them and mm -hmm. communicates to people that they're they're open and transparent. And that tends to light this fire, man, where confidence just starts to grow. And they, yeah. they discover, hey, if I'm wrong, it doesn't mean I'm weak. It, it, it just means that I need to grow in that area and mm -hmm. I need to own that and address it. And all of a sudden, by, you know, expanding vulnerability is a big part of that, and expanding their opportunities to demonstrate openness to the rest of their team. Um, man, that, that just goes off like a Roman candle. In terms yeah, of that's right. Do you find that that when you're at the beginning of the coaching relationship that they have like a preconceived perception that they have to be this overly confident person, but it's in some ways like a facade and it's not even a real like intrinsic confidence that they have? Yeah. Well, one of the first things we do is draw the distinction between confidence and arrogance. Yes. And uh, as a matter of fact, on my on my website, um, one of the blog posts I wrote, matter of fact, the second blog post, the first one is, hey, welcome. And the second one is about it's called a recipe for bold. Mm -hmm. And it, it starts by drawing that distinction. It, you know, it's a, just a little recipe that, that goes over. You know, it's like creates it, it treats bold like a stew. Um, and, and, and one of the things is, you know, approach it with confidence, but leave, leave the arrogance out of the recipe because it tends to make the stew leave a bad taste in everybody's mouth and things like that. So we draw that early distinction and then we start focusing on what confidence really means. And it's interesting. I, I mean, it was interesting to me to, as I began exploring this and how to crack open the confidence nut, that we approach this with vulnerability. I mean, that's not necessarily intuitive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what, what do you mean you're going to Right. You can expose yourself. And that's a that's a confidence builder. It absolutely is. And, and there's it's it's we, we talk about the trust question, which is what something clients can ask their direct reports mm -hmm. when they do periodic performance reviews. Have I ever done or said or failed to do or say anything that's given you reason not to trust me? It could be a scary question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But all, in all the time I've given that to clients to practice. I've never, ever had anybody report back a negative experience. And it's always been this huge booster of, wow, you know, I was trying to build a culture of trust and I was coming to, into all these barriers and that just blew it open. And, and you know, um, so anyway, those are some some of the examples. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to pull a question in from um, from our audience here. So this is from um, Mokadi. I'm sorry if I, if I butcher your name, Mokadi. Question for TD. Uh, TD asserts that coaching and mentoring work in tandem with each other. What is the thinking about the possibility of offering coaching and mentoring as dual intervention approach to coaches? 
Well, that's, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, because I'm, like I said at the beginning, relatively new in this business. I've been doing this for a little over a year, and my practice has, has grown very rapidly. Just, boom. Oh, <laughs> I dropped um, It's grown very rapidly, so I, I've, not, I've not done too much on the kind of marketing these things as kind of individual approaches. Mm -hmm. I think most of us grow up, honestly, it, it, as you grow up as an executive, you wind up mentoring people anyway. Mm -hmm. You're mentoring the executives beneath you. If you're doing your job, you are. You are. Um, in my case, I, I was privileged to grow up in an organization where mentorship was structured and actually built into the plan. Um, mm -hmm. I went to my first squadron as an executive officer or number two with a date in the sand at a later time when I was going to be the commanding officer. So, mm -hmm. that, you know, I was mentored in that approach very systematically. Mm -hmm. and then in the nonprofit world and what I call the social sector, or I had less of a structure, I had the opportunity to search for, hire, and mentor my successor. And so mentorship was something I always did when I was the executive and I was in the saddle. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm a coach, I just kind of find myself naturally doing mentorship as part of my coaching as the client wants it, desires it, and, and needs it. So I would say the balance right now is still probably 75% coaching, 25% mentorship, even in the, you know, probably on average. Um, and I'm trying to be really careful too, because I know that dances across the line where you can start offering advice to people yeah. in certain areas where they now take your advice and it doesn't work because of a multitude of factors that yes. you can't control. So I'm always real careful. The mentorship comes in more in the term, in the form of how my coaching is flavored than it does offering, hey, this is the way you should go in this. As a matter of fact, I, I often get asked that. Well, what yeah. do you think? Should I go this way or this way? And I said, nope, that is not my job. <laughs> you know, that's yours. But but let's let's follow through what the results could be, either one, yeah. and then you can make the call. And then, then I'm able to help guide them that way without offering them advice. I'm not sure if I fully answered that question, um, but I, I, I feel like that kind of at least describes how coaching and mentoring work in my practice. Yeah, got it. Makes sense. Um, we, actually, you talked a little bit earlier about how you measure results and, and a really cool story about in a live meeting, someone being like, this worked, this was fantastic. That yeah. kind of affirmation is great. I know you also send, uh, you, you said after the term, you send a feedback form to your yeah. clients as well. Uh, have you always done that? How do you design that form? what is important about how you collect feedback for your own practice? Sure, sure, sure. Yes, I have. Uh, ever since my, my first client, I've uh, sent that. Now, and to be clear, I send it when each coaching period ends. Actually, I send it about two months before each coaching period ends. But even if the client is going to continue and mm -hmm. sign a new coaching group, begin a new coaching period, because the form allows me to get feedback on my effectiveness and the form is, is structured. I'm happy to share the, the contents of these, by the way, if there's a way to do that afterwards. Yeah, with, yeah we'll do that as a follow-up. The welcome orientation insight. I saw one of the questions was asking about potentially sharing that, you know, and, and the review because my review, my coaching review gives them a chance to A, decide if they want to continue or not. B, decide if they want to go for a six-month or a 12-month coaching agreement because I, I don't do less than six months on a, on a coaching agreement. Mm -hmm. And then it allows them to provide both or either a critique and a testimonial. Mm. Because I, I know there are some things they're going to maybe want to offer a testimonial about, but at the same time, they may want to offer me some critique, you know, yeah. um, maybe maybe suggesting that I look at using DISC uh, maybe as one of the assessments, which I, I am looking at. So, but, you know, those are some things they can offer. So I want to always want to make the client feel like they, they're they welcome because they are welcome to do both or either. And then the form in includes, uh, you know, a, a, I use the, the forms on the, the practice app to do mm -hmm. this. I find it really easy and simple. It allows me to insert a little legal block where they authorize me to use their likeness and their words as a testimonial. And then within a day of getting it, I usually have that up on my website. So that's how I construct the review. It's, it's, it's both a decision point and the opportunity to, uh, to offer me criticism or a testimonial or both. Yeah, this one from Sue. How long is a coaching period, or does it depend on the client that you're working with? Is it standard? okay? Yeah, you probably sent that right before I answered that question. But it's it's either six months or a year. Generally, I'll ask I'll ask um, clients or sponsors, whoever approaches me first about it, 
to, if they're not sure about it or they're looking how it's going to fit in their budget, you know, come on to a six month agreement, but not mm -hmm. less than that. Um, now, it's within my agreement that they can cancel 30 days notice at any time if, if they don't think this is working out or so can I if I don't mm -hmm. think this is working out. Yeah. But uh, by signing on at least for six months, they kind of commit themselves to doing this. And that's important because by the time you do the assessments and do the form and start kind of mm -hmm. getting to know each other, you're easily a month, month and a half into this. thing. Yeah. And so, you know, committing for six months. Uh, and I found that the clients that I've worked with have changed, been able to, to grow as executives or even attain milestones that were the reasons they came into coaching in the first place, like okay. promotion, right? Or, uh, or, or other things, right? Um, that they found that they can do that after six months. But if the agreement had been less than six months, at least with my method of coaching, I would not have been as effective and I wouldn't have seen as, as good a results. Did you do that out of instinct? Like you essentially said, you know what, six months I feel like is enough time or a year is enough yeah. time. Or did you kind of experience like too short of an engagement, maybe two months? You're like, you know what? For me to get real results, I need at least this much time. Yeah, I just it, it really was instinct. I, I thought about the, the situations I've encountered as I was a developing executive over my, my careers. Um, and then when I sought to grow others, how long it took for results to e Well, A, for the, the, the result to get framed for the development to take place to achieve that result and for us to determine some kind of metric or observation that in fact that had been achieved. And when I looked at that, I just thought there's no way you can do this in less than six months with a two week battle rhythm for, for sessions when you're meeting with your, your clients. So if you accelerated that to be weekly meetings, perhaps, but still, in, in my experience, especially with senior executives that lead very, very busy lives that often involve international travel, mm -hmm. you got to work into things like vacations, family vacations and things like that, uh, board retreats, the kind of things that break up a schedule. I just uh, I, I kind of had it as a gut initially and I found it to be the case. So I'm very settled now with six months being the minimal minimum coaching period that I'll sign on for and preferably a year. That's great. That gives me a chance to work with the executive through a fiscal cycle. Yeah, that's great. This is uh, this is from Pavel. This is an interesting follow up to that point. When you approach a client, how do you explain to them that you need your requirement for the relationship is at least six months and not one or three months? Like if someone's saying that this is too much time or they want results faster, have you been in a scenario where uh, people want a shorter term and you're like, no, it needs to be this long? So I've not, I've not had any client approach me and say, Hey, I want to, I, I want to do this for less than six months because I want to get results faster. Mm -hmm. I have had clients within the context of our six month relationship that wanted to get things done in an early stage. We just mm -hmm. accelerated and got those things done in an early stage, but they generally didn't, th those things generally weren't the end of the story. Mm -hmm. They were just part of the story. Right. So to get to the end of the story, which is in, in the situations that I've kind of fallen into, the niche that I've kind of mm -hmm. fallen into is succession. Sometimes six months is enough to get people through a preparatory period where they're getting ready to go into a chief executive role. Mm -hmm. And then there that is a finite end state, right? You got it, you won, yay. And 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 sometimes the, I offer the opportunity for them to continue coaching if they've enjoyed it as a lifestyle, as a development method, yeah. and some do. Um, others are like, hey, this has been great. You helped me get to where I wanted to get to. I'm going to write you a great testimonial and thank you very much. And because this is a relationship and it is, it's, it's not transactional. Mm -hmm. I really feel like if you if you enter into coaching and you're not looking at it as something relationship based rather than transactional, mm -hmm. you're just not going to be effective. Yeah. So, you know, even when I finish a coaching period with somebody, I keep in professional touch with them. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get invited to events where they're going to open a new facility or I'll get invited to their ceremonies where they're going to celebrate their promotion or whatever. And and, uh, and if I can attend, I do. That's great. That's great. I want to take a really quick pivot to like talking about the actual business of running this sure. like your coaching business. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I were, were chatting a little bit earlier about the idea of two paths when you first start. The idea of number one, where you just start with the niche and you define what that is, and that's exactly who you go after. Scenario two being you start actually pretty wide open and you don't have necessarily a niche that you're focused on. 
and you kind of dictate by talking to a lot of people what that niche is based on whatever's a good fit for you. Yeah. Tell us a bit how you came to that decision and, and maybe what you've learned there. <laughs> sure. Trial and error. I, yeah. I actually envy people who are so wrapped tight in what they're about and who they are that they can set up a niche right from the word go. You know, I'm going to be a life coach or, or whatever they're coaching. And that that's awesome. Um, for me, I knew I was a leadership guy. I told you that's kind of how I developed over time. You know, a lot of people come out of their first careers and they've got some kind of skill like marketing or sales or operations. I, I, I prosecuted enemy submarines from the sky. You, there's no market for that in the private sector. So I pretty much leveraged my leadership to come out. But where I was going to fall in terms of my coaching, I wasn't sure. Um, I have this philosophy that leadership is leadership. And whether you're in the government, whether you're in the social sector, whether you're in the commercial private sector, leadership and the same core set of behaviors is effective. So I said, let's just wait in this and see, you know, what clients I get from the private sector, what from the social sector, who from government. Mm -hmm. And I started working in this. I did some, some career coaching, you know, so I took it all on. I was a generalist in terms of, of leadership and career coaching, I would say. Mm -hmm. But then um, I discovered that I was most, hey, I was happiest helping people in succession situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working on a book on succession. And so uh, that started being some that was something that already interested me. And I was getting great feedback from the clients that I was coaching through succession situations. Uh, and so I kind of have, have begun to settle into my niche mm -hmm. there. Um, and I think I'll, as I grow the business intentionally, I'll be growing it in that niche. So yeah. for me, it was trial and error to, to kind of find my niche rather than jumping right in uh, with a niche. But uh, ever since I heard the term, and I heard this when I got into coaching, was that ri the riches are in the niches. <laughs> I I, uh, I started saying, well, maybe I should start thinking about what I'm most effective in. That's yeah. I, I mean, the idea of, I think, casting a really wide, net, especially if you're new in the business, casting a really wide net and figuring out where not only like where your clients get the most value, but where you get the most enjoyment in working with those kinds of people yeah. like where they are is so important. And it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, put you in a situation where if you start with the niche, you don't know what you don't know in some cases. Um, so that's great. This is a question from the community. Also a question I had on my list. I love to hear about your services, what you offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, what is the kind of suite that you offer? I, I think that that's really important to understand too. Okay, this is a, a going to be an interesting one. So when I first got into this business, um, I had just come back with Barbara, my wife, from sailing. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine who ran a leadership development company, Simple Leadership Strategies, uh, I had hired them to coach or, or to actually lead, train my, my core of managers uh, when I was at United Way. Um, asked me if I'd be interested in coming on helping grow his company. That's actually how I got involved in leadership development after being a sailor and catching mm -hmm. uh, in Mahi Mahi for a career. So we, <laughs> which was awesome. I got to lie But um, so I came into Simple Leadership Strategies. I, I, uh, he named me CEO of that company and he stayed on as founder and president and we have grown that company. Now the company did not do coaching at the time. They mm -hmm. did leadership development as kind of a group coaching effort, but they didn't do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So while I was still doing that group coaching there with SLS, I began my practice through a bold leader. A bold leader was just a blog when it started, but okay. when I got asked to do, to be a coach, and as I said at the beginning of this, I'm kind of the accidental coach, uh, a job I had applied for 12 years ago and, and uh, didn't take because I accepted the offer with the American Red Cross, it came open again. Mm -hmm. And the headhunter called me and asked me if I wanted it. I said, I didn't. They hired somebody. And then he said, well, the, the board wants this person to have a coach. And I hear you're a leadership guy. Would you be a coach? Then I started scrambling around going, how do I structure this? What do I charge for it? <laughs> it's sort of yeah. like that. And so I entered into coaching that way on the one-on-one -on -one side. So to, it, today I do group coaching on the SLS side. And now we've grown one-on-one -on -one coaching through Simple Leadership Strategies. And I do one-on-one -on -one coaching on through a bold leader. And I, and I keep those, you know, going at the same time. Mm -hmm. And my services are essentially one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, 
the leadership development piece in terms of group coaching and assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not yet gotten into offering things like PDFs, how to do this, how to set up your succession plan, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. However, as I've started, I've got three book projects in work right now. And as those start to bubble toward completion, I think I will start leveraging those to add some product elements mm -hmm. to my offerings. Um, Cause a lot of people who are scaling their business are doing so with those kind of products yeah. uh, to, you know, to be more of a publicly accessible kind of thing. Uh, I'm not there yet, but that's something I'm looking at opening up as this thing grows. Yeah, that's great. Another follow-up, this is from Craig too on that, is when you're in your group sessions, what do you tend to focus on? Is it more general in topics or are they more specific on based on the, the needs of the group? Well, again, this is a, a company th that my friend John built over 18 years, and it's got a very, very unique and structured approach, which was the reason I'm helping him grow it, because... I told him when he put us through that back when I was the CEO at United Way and used him to train my team that it was the only leadership training I would ever endorse because it actually worked. It, it's, it's leadership development, not, not just management training. Mm -hmm. And it, it caused people to change. So it had accountability mechanisms in there and it was able to do what I call self-customizing. Mm -hmm. um, much of the way I approach my coaching in this group coaching method are really leadership development sessions that are done by groups of 10 virtually, no more than 10 virtually, or no more than 14 live. Mm -hmm. um, these are focused on some specific behaviors that, that transformational leaders demonstrate. So there is kind of a curriculum that goes through that. Uh, okay. It is self-customized because the information that's put out is the same to everybody but everybody brings the application of those concepts based on whatever they're working with currently in their job. Right. So you can have a frontline supervisor going through at the same time as a CEO. So that self customizes customization element really is what makes it valuable. So Got it. your question, Craig. Yeah, that's good. Um, in the day to day of running your business, maybe just like the operation side or um, how you maintain that feeling of each client, feeling that they're their their own client of yours yeah um what do you find is some of the more challenging parts that maybe you didn't anticipate of the actual business of running a coaching business well i mean a lot of it i i, I did anticipate my wife is a professional photographer she had her own business so i was able to see her operate as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and i was an observer um i have had had before now had a, a steady paycheck my whole life i was in the navy for 31 years mm -hmm. i got paid every other week uh, I've you know, moved into nonprofits. I worked for big organizations like the American Red Cross and United Way. I got paid every week. This was something that's newly entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. and I was excited about it. So I threw myself into it. I started getting my finances together. I went and registered for a DBA at the courthouse, mm -hmm. and I set up my bank accounts and you know, and, and got my finances all set up and going and things. And then uh, I was discovering rapidly, though, that keeping a coaching practice going the way I wanted to, with a personal relationship and continuous touch points and very involved mm -hmm. was a, no, it was a mess because yeah. there were so many different products and platforms that you had to bring in. And I needed to get out of the business of just crafting a different email every time. And I had to get out of the business of using another platform to book sessions. I needed to automate that. And that's mm -hmm. when I, I, I was sharing with Jeremy at the beginning of this. I, I had, was on LinkedIn and had seen ads come across for practice. Mm -hmm. And I skipped over them because I get ads for a lot of stuff. And until, until one day it interested me enough to, to see what it was that I made the click. And before I was done with that 10 minute session, I signed on because it, it promised to bring so many things together that I was struggling to, to keep together in an integrated platform. And, uh, and I've, I've not, I've not been disappointed. The platform, um, it wasn't initially perfect and it's still not perfect, but the, mm -hmm. the, the team is so responsive on, Hey, thanks for that feedback. Here's the fix that it is, is rapidly approaching perfection. And it's already at the point where I use it reliably every day to keep in touch with my clients, to keep on top of their birthdays, to send them uh, notes and texts that are separate from their normal flow of information. Mm -hmm. I find that's really important for confidentiality. Uh, because some of the executives that I coach have other people that check their email accounts and things. Mm -hmm. And so by doing everything through practice, that gives me a, a completely separate 
method of communication with them. So um, it, it's it's practice has been a, a game changer for me in terms of getting this baby off the ground. That's great. That's awesome to hear. Um, okay, this is another one from the community here. This is from uh, Mokadi again. I hear T talking about assessment assessments like DISC. Um, have you ever used TD, uh unique assessment tool known as LEPA, Leadership and Emotional Intelligence Performance Accelerator, L-E-I-P-A, LEPA? No, but I will check it out. I'm actually in the process right now of considering uh, a program called MAP, um, which is done by Talent Insights out of Fort Worth, Texas, uh, something that kind of uh, integrates Myers-Briggs and DISC. Uh, I'm, I'm exploring that. I'm always looking for an opportunity to find a, a method of advancing the assessment game to, for it to be more comprehensive. Uh, pretty happy with what I've got now with Clifton Strengths and Via because I'm used to doing that. Um, we use it in simple leadership strategies as well. Mm -hmm. But um, but I am always looking for a way to improve that. So thanks for the tip. I'll check it out. Yeah, that's great. Okay, last question that I have is to round things out. What advice do you have? This is always a great way to end. Uh, for people who are just launching their coaching business, you weren't in those shoes too long ago. Right. What do you wish you would have known way back then that looking back makes a lot of sense now? But what advice do you have for people just starting? Man, um, first I'd say structure yourself to get into it. Um, set a realistic expectation for growth. Um, I, I've been very blessed in that my practice has grown uh, faster than I thought it would, um, which has presented a whole nother set of problems, right? It's how I keep up with this and continue to give that level of client service mm -hmm. so that each client is, uh, it feels like they're my only client. Mm -hmm. But um, but set, set your pace. For example, I determined how much I wanted to work. I mean, I am in the late third quarter of my life. And so I've decided um, I'm gonna be, I'm probably a little generous to myself there, but um, so I've, I've, <laughs> I've decided that uh, this is how much I want to work, and this is how I want to invest my experience and expertise in helping mm -hmm. others. Uh, again, I, I really feel like coaching is my calling, and I've not always felt that way about coaching. So mm -hmm. be the kind of coach you would want. Be the kind of coach where you can be proud of the offering you give and, and be the kind of coach that that you set your pace to deliver that great level of service and never get so inundated that you feel like you're slighting a client when you, when you sign on, that's, that's the, the, that's how I approach this. And I have found that to be incredibly gratifying. Mm -hmm. So for folks that are just starting out, that's what I would recommend. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for your time. It's been a blast. Uh, this recording will be made, made available. We'll send it to anyone who registered. Um, thank you all so much for joining. It's been a total blast to talk leadership. TD, thanks, thanks for you. Um, we'll see you all out there. Have a great rest of your day and, and take care, everyone. Good luck. Bye now.